Welcome back to Hawaii Real, everybody. I'm your host, Ioke Ehu. And this episode is brought to you by Hawaiian Springs Water, our beverage host for this episode. You can find them on Amazon. Also, if you don't find them in your uh, grocery store or convenience stores, you can order it on Amazon and have it uh, delivered directly to your house. It's great stuff. 7.7 alkaline, best tasting water I've ever had. And this episode is brought to you by the Native Hawaiian Chamber of Commerce. The Native Hawaiian Chamber of Commerce's mission is to malama Native Hawaiians in business and commerce through leadership, relationships, and connections to economic resources and opportunities. The Chamber's programs and events are designed to facilitate connections and promote business growth, professional and economic development, and sustainability. The Chamber's membership is open to individuals, nonprofit organizations, and businesses of all sizes. To learn more about the Chamber and how you can join, visit the website www.NativeHawaiianChamberOfCommerce.org. Okay, today I have with me a super awesome lady, Jan Kaeo. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Jan. So Jan is the president of the Dale Carnegie Training. Yeah. And at first, I remember we had spoken on the phone. I was like, what is that? And you know, like, we had a whole conversation on it because I was like, Carnegie, like the New York rich people kind of Carnegie is like, yes, but also more than that. And it's such an interesting thing. And when I mention it to people... Now, after having a conversation with you, they're like, oh, yeah, Dale Carnegie. Yeah, it's like super awesome stuff and getting people to change their mindsets and stuff like that. It's like, oh, well, yeah, that's right up my alley. Yeah. Come on the show. Thanks. And you call yourself a change agent. Yes. I was like, what is it? What, what, what's a change agent? And it's like, okay, so you sell people on the value of change so mm. that you're not changing them, but they're uh, influencing the change upon themselves. Yeah, actually... Um, I really believe in the power of change, um, that everything can always be just a little bit better. And it's um, being able to understand why you would even want to change. So many of us, we're happy. We're really content the way we are. But your outcome isn't going to change if you never change. And so helping people understand the value of change, like why would you want to change if there's no real value, people aren't going to change it. Take a work environment. Maybe you need to downsize, right size. Um, and so change needs to happen. If people don't understand the value of change, then change is scary. It, it brings out all kinds of fear and um, lack of confidence in change. But if they can understand why and why it's important to them, they'll be more open to change and we can help them um make that transition. That's so important, the why behind that. And we're going to totally dive into that. But there's even more to you. Um, your friend here called you a miracle worker. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and is that true? Like you just work miracles, not just for people, but for businesses? Well, I, I think it's first and foremost, I really love people. And I really see the best in people and who they can become if it's important or if it's uh, something that they want to become. And I think that I'm able to have really critical conversations with people and help them see the best um, is yet to come and then selling the value of change. And there are individuals and organizations who've been the same way they've been, you know, for the last 10, 15, 20 years. You'll hear comments like, this is who I am. This is how it is. This is how we've always done it. And because they don't understand why change would make it better. And I think what I'm able to do is to help them discover that there's something better on the other side of change. Um, and and sometimes it feels like it's a miracle. We need you in the city and county. <laughs> because, yeah, they're really hard to change a, a lot of the times. It's, it's kind of frustrating at a lot of times. But You know, Eo, actually, we're working with the city and county. We help them, and I say help them, we didn't do it. We help them create this leadership program um, from visionaries in the city who really want to develop leaders within the city. You have lots of managers. You have people that are responsible for leading people, but they just haven't had the right tools. And, you know, in the construction business, if you use the right tool, you can get the job done. I think what we've done is help them develop those communication tools, developing confidence, developing those people skills to help them inspire their workforce. And so, you know, your desire, putting it out there, it's already in the making. And we've been working with them for about, I, I want to say three years now. 
And we can really see the change as these people who've worked for the city, they're very loyal, right? They're committed. They've worked there for 10, 15, 20 years. And many of them say, you know, we never we never got this kind of training. We didn't know this kind of training existed. And so now they are discovering how to use different tools to get the job done. And it's pretty exciting. It, it's it's totally huge, especially from my point of view working in the city and county, is that we sometimes have people get promoted or moved into managerial positions that never had any kind of uh, supervisor or managerial training. Right. And they think maybe one day or two day, three day training is good enough. Sometimes they don't even get that. And they end up faltering or failing because they're just not confident in um, the skills that they have or might have or might learn and and grow into of uh, being a leader. And it's so frustrating sometimes. Yeah, you, you, that's the classic example of someone is successful in their current job. So who do you promote? You promote the most successful person, right? right? That totally makes sense. So you promote them, but you don't give them the tools that they need to be successful in the new position. So what do you do? You apply the tools that were made you successful in the first position, and you find it's not enough. And so if you can get those kinds of leadership skills, like people skills, like more confidence in being able to have critical conversations to drive performance, you can be more successful in the new position. When you don't get training, what happens is within six months, they want to quit. Yeah. Like nobody wants to be a manager because it's so hard. Or but, nobody wants to work for the person. Right. Or nobody wants to work for that manager. Yeah. Right. Want to get to know you a little bit. Uh, had some questions here. What city are you from? I am from Kali. Oh, interesting. Yeah. What, what street? I grew up in Kalihi um, off of Liliha Street in a little lane called Dayton Lane. Oh, yeah. Um, went to Lanakila Elementary. Really proud of that. <laughs> then went to Kowananakua Intermediate. And then after that, I had to make a really hard choice. Was it going to be McKinley or Farrington? Because we were right on the border. And I decided. Not oh, no, I guess no. not. Huh? Yeah, it was either Farrington or McKinley. Okay. And I decided at that point that I really wanted to be more than I than I was. And I realized that I needed to do something different. So I asked my parents if I could go to a private school. Nice. And they said, no, you can't <laughs> because we can't afford it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, my Both of my parents were blue collar workers. And um, I said, what, you know, I hear they give out these scholarship things. So what if I get a scholarship? Can I go? And they said, well, that's like a lot of work and we don't know how to do it. We don't have anybody that's gone to a private school. So um, I did the research. I got myself an interview at Marinol. I convinced them that I was worth investing in. And I got to go to Marinol first on a scholarship. Um, and then um, my parents were able to afford our final year and um, was able to graduate from Marinol High School. That's such a great story. That is, I, You don't hear stories like that much anymore, where the child is putting themselves out there and doing all the research to get into a private school. I've, I mean, you hear that for colleges and stuff, but it's almost, yeah, when you're in high school and you're looking to get money and everything to go to college, it's kind of almost expected in some families. But to do that to get into a private school, like how old were you, were you trying to, to do this when you were trying, uh, to, were I was you trying to get into? 15. So you were trying to get in in 11th grade? I was trying to get in the 10th grade. Okay. Mm -hmm. Still, that's so young to try to do that. Well, so at that age, you get to make choices, right? You mm -hmm. can either decide that you're going to study um, and then you have a whole group of friends, hopefully, that like to study or not. And I was really being pressured at that time to either be with the kids who wanted to study, but I really wasn't like them. Or I was, uh, if I went to Farrington, I would be in fights all the time. <laughs> and I just decided that I wanted more for my life. Yeah. And so I reached for something different. But did you have anybody at your age that was doing that with you? Or, no. You know, no role model or anything? Nope. Wow. Nope. That, tell, that says oh, so much about you and your personality and your character well, in a very positive way. Well, I think that from an, from an early age, um, I, I just wanted to be the best that I could be, not be better than someone else, but just to be the best. And that's how my parents raised me and rewarded that behavior. 
Um, so I just wanted to be the best me. I didn't really know what that was, but I knew that um, if I went to McKinley, um, I may not have succeeded to the best of my ability. And if I went to Farrington, I didn't think that I could be the best to my ability there. So I wanted something different. Um, and I knew to have something different, I would have to work for it. And challenge. And you just, it seemed like you just wanted challenge. Yeah. When I went to Marino, they said that you, um, you, they have to push me back probably a grade or two um, because I had come from a public school and probably not prepared. Um, and I challenged them and I said, no, I am ready to be at my grade level and I will prove it to you. So awesome. The, <laughs> the awesome story just continues. Like, that's insane. They wanted to hold you back. And you're just like, no. Nope. I said, I'm, no, I'm going I in think. 10th grade. No. Yep. Yep. I'm going to go in the 10th grade. And uh, I went into an advanced um, foreign language class because I got really good um, uh, uh, teachers at the at Koananakoa. So I felt like I'm prepared and let me show you that I can do it. What language was it? Spanish. Oh, nice. Yeah. Habla español. Si. Nice. I, that's it. That's it for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm part Puerto Rican. Sorry. That's all I do. Hola. Yeah. yeah. Yo quiero Taco Bell. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. So uh, continuing on with getting to know you, uh, do you have any nicknames? Um, not really. Not really. Um, when I was growing up, um, my uh, dad used to call me JJ. There was that that crazy uh, sitcom. I'm not really sure why I got that name because JJ was this, you know, skinny Afro-American kid that was super funny and I wasn't any of those three things, uh, but that was my nickname. Nice. Yep. Little JJ. Yeah. Cool. Shave ice or ice cream? Mm, ice cream. Ice cream? What flavor? Uh, vanilla, Swiss almond vanilla from haagen -Dazs. Wow. Yeah. Very specific. Yes. That sounds so delicious. Oh my God. Swiss almond vanilla from Hagen. Hagen Dazs yes. by and far just has really good creamy ice cream. Yes, lots of calories. <laughs> no, shh. no, they don't. It's <laughs> zero calories. What's your favorite local food? Fried rice. Ooh, do you have a specific fried rice? Yeah, the one that I make. Oh, <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> Which is my mother's recipe. Nice. Mm -hmm. Do you use what is it, oyster sauce? Oh yes. Oh yeah. But only a specific brand. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. My favorite fried rice is from Mililani Restaurant. Oh, I've never been there. Yeah. And they've been making the same fried rice since I was a kid. And what do you like about it? How fatty it is. I think they use literal lard in it but it's, or butter. I don't know. But you get a real bad tummy ache after you eat like a whole plate. Oh, my gosh. But it's worth it. Wow. I'll have to go so there. So greasy and good. Yeah. With an egg on top. Yeah. Well, oh I actually God. like the scrambled eggs then mix it inside. Mm. But yeah, they do, the apple, try they do the egg on top, they do lunch meat on top, um, and they have all different types of fried rice. Wow. I haven't heard lunch and meat in a long time. Lunch and meat. Yeah. It's a big old square thing of ham. There you go. Love it. Oh my God. Clogging my arteries just thinking about <laughs> it. <laughs> do you have a favorite uh, outdoor activity here? Uh, it's probably walking. It's probably best place walking. in the world for it. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Do you live in Kalihi? I uh, so no, I agree. no, okay. no, no. We, uh, we go somewhere else to walk. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> somewhere with sidewalks. <laughs> we won't get hit. <laughs> no, there's because I used to work in, in Kalihi, Kalihi Valley oh, for nice. nine years. And yeah, there's some places, there's just no sidewalks. Right. It's like house, grass, road. Right. Yeah, no it's beautiful walk. there, uh, yeah. but when it's raining, they can't see you. Right. So you could be a Manoa. casualty. Manoa is terrible. Yes. Like, you should not jog on the street in Manoa. Jeez. Right. You could trip also because there's lots of tree roots. Yeah. Well, people end up running on the road. It's like, God, yes, yeah, terrible. <laughs> uh, oh, so you, well, we discussed this a little bit off camera, but do you have a spirit animal? I don't have a spirit animal. I think that um, I'm, I'm a very spiritual person, but I've never thought of having a spirit animal. So in my family, our amakua is the mano, the shark. Oh, interesting. So, um, uh, but I don't relate to sharks. So um, I don't know. Or because um, I'm looking at it, I'm like, mm, no, I kind of see that. Really? Yes. It's yeah. a very powerful animal. And just from what you've told, 
me so far in this conversation, Mm -hmm. you are an extremely powerful person. Oh, thank you. With the the know-how as a young young lady to do what you just did with uh, getting into marital and forcing your way. And did you and did you go off to college after that? Yes. Mm-hmm. Where'd you go? I went to UH Manoa. Okay. So just putting yourself through all that when you had family, like your parents were just telling you, "Hey, we can't even afford that," but right. you just powered. You found a way to freaking do it. Right. That is so powerful. Thank you. Yes. So yes, yeah. probably a shark, powerful protector. Yeah. Do whatever it takes. Do whatever it takes. That's kind of my mantra. Yeah. And I can kind of sense that you're not one to follow the school, the fish. You're just kind of out there doing it on your own if you need to. Yeah. I um, In every career that I've had, um, I do want to understand what the boundaries are so that I can be on the boundary. <laughs> oh. Pushing it. Pushing but I, it. But I do want to know... Because I have a very strong uh, commitment to integrity. So I, I want to know where the boundaries are. I want to know where is that box that I'm supposed to operate in. But I'm always testing the boundary to see if it's real mm-hmm. um, or if it's time to go beyond and set new boundaries. That is, that's huge. And I love that. Just that one little tidbit. I'm going to chop that up and put that on TikTok. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, you're going to be on TikTok. Go ahead. Oh, God. Uh, oh, do you scare easily? I don't think so, but I don't want, I don't like to watch scary movies. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Only because I'm a visual person and I, I think through these things that I've seen. Um, I'm also a very spiritual person. So, um, you know, I, I believe in all of that yeah, and, I, and, ghosts, I'm a, yeah. and I'm a feeler, um, you know, in our, in, in our uh, Hawaiian culture, I'm a feeler. So I can feel the spirits. If they're not good, I can tell you where they are in the room. It's just how I've grown up. So. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I feel the, the the same way because one of the scariest movies I'd ever seen was the Blair Witch Project. Mm-hmm. And the scariest parts were when they were out camping at night in their tent and like something's hitting the tent oh and you gosh. can just hear children laughing outside. Oh. There's no children. They go out there and there's nobody there and they're running and they're running and there's the camera's following them and lights are going all over the place because oh I've been camping in woods like that and I've heard crazy mm. things like that. So I related directly with that. I was like, that's scary. I don't want to watch this anymore. I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, is there a movie that you've seen multiple times? Um, let me see. I think one of the, um, one of my favorite movies is uh, The Sound of Music. Interesting. And I think it's because it's about overcoming adversity. Mm-hmm. Um, and I love music. I come from a musical family. And um, it's about it, it's about doing good, being good, and not letting anything stop you from going through your fear to get to the other side. So who do you relate to most in that movie? I actually relate to all of the characters in that movie. Yeah. The whole family unit. The whole family, the kids. Um, Yeah. I, yeah. I love that movie. Very cool. Uh, Who in history, if you could go back in time or bring them back to forward in time, would you like to have a conversation with a historical figure? That's a super tough question. Because you got to pick one? Yeah, because you have to pick one. There's been so many interesting people from all around the world that would be super interesting to maybe bring them together in a podcast. Oh, but the podcast got you just got to have two people. Oh. Who would it be? Who would it be? Hmm. That you could get really deep with. I you know, I um I don't have an answer for that. Because um I'm interested in uh people from very uh, different cultures, mm-hmm. from different uh, periods of time. Um, I would love to, uh, I would love to talk to Socrates, um, and learn, sit at the foot of Socrates and be able to learn from his method of facilitation. Um, 
I would also, uh, I would really love to have an intimate conversation live with, uh, with Jesus. Oh, good one. Lots of questions. And um, I think that one of the things he did um, amazingly well was sell the value of change. To be able to inspire people to think differently, um, to reconnect with what's really important to them. Um, and I think what's really important in that conversation is the application. So it's one thing to think about change. It's one thing to say that you're committed to whatever. But how do you apply it in your everyday life? How do you show up as that person? So I would love to have a deeper conversation there. I also, uh, my interests span from, from history to politics to music, um, people who've really made a difference in other people's lives. I would love to talk to Abraham Lincoln. Um, because I think that he overcame so many challenges. And so understanding that, you know, what's at the heart that someone would continue to face um, adversity that seemed just insurmountable, you know, what drove you to be able to overcome that change? And Lincoln just had a vision that nobody else really saw at the time. Mm -hmm. He saw it and he's clear mm -hmm. and he just forced his way through it. Right. Yeah. And yeah, he led, you know, our country together and, or brought our country back together and, you know, uh, the rest is history. So. Yeah. And the people with him just didn't see that. Right. And the things that he did. So amazing, especially watching the movie, Lincoln. Yes. And seeing that, that was very historically accurate, right? Mm -hmm. Daniel Day-Lewis, shout out to you. Great, great job. Yeah. And yeah, so I love that movie. Uh one of the things I like about that question is it kind of shows the audience who your role model is mm. and who you, who you kind of uh, pick some of your characteristics from. So like the whole Jesus thing is like, damn, that's a good one. Yeah. And the thing for change. Yeah. That's, that's, that was his whole thing. So right. great. Right. Inspired people to think differently, mm -hmm. um, whether you agreed with him or not. Um, and just his methodology, the, the way that he approached people um, was pretty profound. While he stood for views that were very different from the predominant thought, he didn't impose himself on others. He really asked lots of questions and got people to reconsider um, their foundational values. And if there were gaps in their belief, it caused them to question their own belief system. Um, and in many cases, inspired change. Change that last, lasted um, not just one lifetime, but many, many, many generations. Yeah. Just the history of that is just amazing. Yeah. Great answer. Great, great answer. Last question on this world. Okay. And again, another question that kind of just looks into the internal character of my guest here. If you had superpowers, what would they be? Oh. And why? So if I had a superpower, I would want to help people to become more confident in their ability to be more than they already are. Um, and to be able to do that with a lot less effort than I'm doing it right now. Um, I think that when people become more confident, they, they show up differently and they're able to focus away from themselves and focus on others. And I think that that in turn helps others to become more confident. And I think it, I think it just, it's like a pebble in the water, and um, you can spread that that good mana um, everywhere you go. So I would love to be that person who can do that. Kind of like Professor X. Yeah. Let's get into the minds of people and, and make the change in their mind like yeah. that. Yeah. And then you could put on the big helmet and go into Cerebrus. Cerebrus? Is that what it's called? Mm. Yeah. Fun times. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's dive into... Dale Carnegie. Okay. 
Uh, can you give a brief audience, uh, give the audience a brief of who he was and how this whole thing got started as far as an organization? Yeah. So Dale Carnegie um, in 1912 um, started a whole movement. He's often claimed to be the founder of workplace learning. So the whole idea that um, in the work environment, if you could train someone, you could help them become the best version of themselves. And so he started out as um, a, a teacher teaching public speaking. That's what he um, his first classes were. And he found that the reason why it was public speaking is that he thought that business people needed to be better public speakers to be more successful in their work or in their career. And that was pretty short-lived. It, it was a skill that was necessary, but it wasn't the only skill. The things that were being asked of him were things like, how do I get along better with my boss? How do I inspire this person who doesn't want to move, um, doesn't want to do better, to do better? Um, it's interesting that after a hundred and, what is that, a hundred and eight years, we still have the same challenges yes. with the human race, right? Really. How do we how do we get along with our boss? How do we get along with our coworkers? How do we even the whole topic of diversity and inclusion? You know, how do we include people and help them feel like they belong? How do we engage our workforce so that we not only get along better, but how do we produce more as a team? And so, um, published a book uh, as a it was supposed to be a textbook, and it was called How to Win Friends and Influence People came out in 1936. And when it was published, it was it was going to be a textbook, but it quickly became a bestseller. And within the first year, they had to publish it three times. It was like wildfire that people had these stories that helped them to become more confident, helped them to be a better communicator, helped them to be better at getting along with other people, also helped them to be a better leader, a person of influence. And since that time, since 1936, it's been listed uh, on the top 20 books to read in business. Um, I think it was Forbes magazine that it said that that book was the book that changed the 21st century. Wow. Okay. So pretty proud of Dale Carnegie's accomplishments. His wife actually helped take his teachings worldwide. Um, so she was the person that um, caught his vision and then took it to the next level. And so Dale Carnegie Training is now in over um, 200 offices in over 80 countries, taught in over 30 languages worldwide. So is that where the, the his book has translated into uh, an organization that goes out and trains people now? So it started off as he was the primary trainer. He was like a um, a huge celebrity that just went around the world training from his book. And then he taught others, and they called them sponsorships. And they taught, began to teach in um, uh, different different cities, different parts of the world. It was almost like a, a global reach, but a local touch. And uh, so there's the Dale Carnegie course that we have over 9 million graduates worldwide. And it, it branched off to a leadership development program. We now have like four levels of leadership. Then it we also taught that same concept about getting along, inspiring, um, being more confident in sales. Um, also public speaking still, his public speaking courses. And um, what am I missing? Leadership, customer service, sales, and the Dale Carnegie course, which is about communication and building solid relationships. And so now you are the, not just the president of it. So have you taught Dale Carnegie um, subject? Yeah. What, what is it called? Yeah. So it's so we have over 200 courses that are available. Mm. Um, our trainers, and I'm a trainer, is certified um, internationally to be able to deliver depending on the curriculum. So if you're a Dale Carnegie course instructor, which is about communication and relationships and managing stress, then you uh, are able to train that course worldwide. We're an accredited institution, so we can give college credits for our courses um, and all of our major courses. Um, and, um, so, and we also can give continuing education credits. So if you're an engineer, if you're a teacher, if you're an accountant and you need annual um, uh, credit courses, to fulfill your licensure, mm -hmm. you can take a Dale Carnegie course in 
get credits. So with all these courses, what are the top three most popular ones? The Dale Carnegie course. It's it's the foundational course, how to be confident. Is that like the first one people mm-hmm. take? Okay. I would say that would be phase one. Um, phase two is as you become confident and a better communicator, you're often that person that gets promoted and you're ready for what we call phase two. So phase two is about understanding yourself as a leader. What are my strengths? What are my secondary strengths? What are my gaps? Because I want to know what my gaps are. And then we work on those strengths in the workplace because it's a very practical application. And we measure your success from the time you start to the time you're done. And then once you're successful there, now you need more tools, right, to be successful. So in that phase three level, it's about how do I delegate effectively to build my people? How do I measure performance and have performance conversations so that instead of making a sushi roll, if you're in the restaurant business, right, making a sushi roll in you're making it in two minutes and it's supposed to be made in 30 seconds. How do I inspire that person to get to that level of performance so that the business can run more effectively? So that's that's level, that's the, fa- the third phase. Performance management system, delegation system, how to create an innovative work environment that inspires creativity, right? Um, because people support a world they help create So why not get their ideas? Often the best ideas come from the field. So how to be a leader that's not afraid of other people's ideas because they might show you up, but be a leader that's confident enough to inspire other people to bring their ideas to the table. Because when they win and they're happy, you win as a leader. Is there like a big name brand or popular company that aspires to all of these lessons and has used that to build their success that you could talk upon? Yeah, so you've heard of Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. We have contracts with 450 of the Fortune 500 companies. There you go. So probably the ones that you'd recognize are companies like Dell. We are the premier leadership development arm for Dell and VMware. Uh, We have contracts with Google. We have contracts with um, the Kaiser Group, so Kaiser uh, Healthcare. Um, Indeed is, everybody knows Indeed because they're looking for a new job. We are the primary um, trainer for the Indeed team. So what is it, what is Indeed? I know you said everybody knows uh, it and I'm like, uh, Indeed is I'm like monster.com on steroids. Oh, so, okay. Looking for jobs. Looking for jobs. Okay. Yeah. So the people that are working those, um, those resumes who are trying to invite people to be a part of the Indeed group like Monster, mm-hmm. um, we, we're a primary trainer for them. I think. Two million a year is what we do globally for Indeed. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Any local companies? So local companies, um, we've worked um, a lot with Hawaiian Dredging. Um, They are known as the premier uh, leadership development arm in construction. Every industry has a a an organization that is the training organization for success. Hawaiian Dredging has occupied that role for. I want to say 40 years that I know of. Um, so they're and, training other? Well, no, they, they train young leaders. Okay. Um, they show them the ropes. They train young leaders, and they often either stay with Hawaiian Dredging because they're big, um, or sometimes they rotate out to a new organization um, and bring e- exceptional skills, and we work with them. Uh, we've worked with a number of insurance companies. Um, we're really proud of our relationship with Hemic and um, some additional insurance companies, but construction, insurance, healthcare. Um, yeah. So those are some of the big ones. Yeah. What? Servco, Carrier. Mm-hmm. So what's the big, I know we were talking about earlier um, making change or convincing people of the value of change. How big a part does that play in what you do with Dale Carnegie? I think it's huge. I think it's huge because we're giving people skills or let, let me go back before skills. It's really about creating the vision that they can be more than they already are. They can be more successful. They can be more confident. And confidence is different for every person. Confidence sometimes is being able to raise your hand and offer your idea because you think you have a good one. Or being able to, um, I had this happen last week. 
We had a very productive employee who's overworked, who's been promised help in their organization and hasn't gotten it. And she was able to go to the owner and have a very critical conversation about how important this change is um, to the to the point that he apologized for not acting on that change sooner. Now, this is a person who would never have had that conversation 10 weeks ago. But the confidence that she's developed, her ability to communicate her ideas in a clear and concise way, um, and her belief in her value to the organization all contributed to her willingness to initiate the conversation and then actually have it and be understood and then create change for herself. She'll never be the same again. Do you think that's like a Hawaii thing? I think... Necessarily with this, with our society and our culture of not pushing back on authority figures? I think it is a Hawaii thing, but I also think that it's a... So it's a culture thing, but I think that... And part of the reason why I got involved in the Dale Carnegie business is I've always believed that we have very talented people. We have people here in Hawaii who are very capable. We're confident, but we don't show up confident. You know, we wait till the opportunity arises, and then we kind of second guess ourselves because we don't need to be right. We're pretty confident in who we are, but it doesn't help create change. And so what I believe is if you give people tools and they use the right tools, we can get change a lot faster. Like that, that gal who's overworked, right? Um, she is amazing. If they don't have change in that organization, she's going to leave, right? And in, in today's world, as we come through COVID, we can't afford to lose our good people. We just can't. There aren't enough other good people for us to hire. Mm-hmm. Okay, so when you guys are doing these things at the Dale Carnegie, what are the typical blocks that you see that leaders have that they have to get over? Blocks, walls, hurdles? What's the typical ones that you guys kind of see? Well, I think that first and foremost, leaders don't want others to know that they're not super confident in what they're doing. So there's there's a confidence level that um, is important for leaders to recognize that it would be helpful for them to be more confident. You know, it's interesting um, when someone becomes a leader and they have like their toolbox, they usually have three communication tools. So the first tool is if I ask you to do something because you work for me and um, and you don't do it, I'll repeat myself because, you know, repetition is the mother of learning. That's how we all learned in school. Okay. So I repeat myself. If you don't respond to repetitive requests, what I'll do is I'll often speak louder because maybe you didn't hear me, like there's something wrong with your hearing. So I'll speak louder so that you pay attention and that you get it done. And if that doesn't work, I'm now frustrated as a leader. So then I speak harshly to you. Because if I speak harshly, then you'll know I'm serious and that maybe you'll get it done. And usually those are the three tools that a leader brings to the manager level. And in today's world, it's not enough. Because if I repeat myself, I might get, you know, uh, faces made at me like, what? Um, I heard or, you the first time. Right. Or if I repeat myself and then I'm speaking louder, your listener, your worker might feel offended. And today when you offend a worker, they could file a complaint or mm-hmm. they could just quit. That's the worst. If they just quit and they don't show up tomorrow, that's the worst. So, you know, don't yell at your workers, okay? And then the third thing is if I if I speak harshly to you, um, you definitely might get a complaint. And I hear that a lot. So, and they don't, leaders don't even realize that they're limited to those three tools. So the first is to recognize that you need more tools. You need different ways to be able to win friends and influence people. Dale Carnegie, everything Dale Carnegie has done comes from these 30 human relations principles. And before I leave, I'm going to give you um, this golden book. Nice. So in it is going to have 30 human relations. Here, you can have okay, it Okay, okay, okay. There's 30 human relations principles. So the first nine, um, because think about, um, Eo, how did you learn how to um, have relationships? Like from my parents. Okay, where where else did you learn? 
uh, from friends and okay. from television. Okay. Maybe like playing in the sandbox. Oh, yeah. Playing yeah. with other kids. Yeah. So you kind of learn that, right? Now, if you never played outside, so there's a lot of kids who never played outside. If you, um, if your parents didn't have a lot of friends, you kind of didn't learn how to do all of that. So you often model what you saw as a child. If you came from a family that was very dysfunctional, was manipulative, manipulative to one another, that's kind of how you learned it. So what Dale Carnegie said is if we can give you tools to build trust and credibility, which are the first nine principles, you more likely will learn how to do that. And you can do it again and again and repeat success. So once you build trust and credibility, we give you nine ways to do that. Now we can show you how to get willing cooperation. Instead of simple compliance, you just do it because I said so. Willing cooperation is people are going to do it because they want to do it, because mm -hmm. they want to do it for you because you're a good boss, right? Um, we teach you those principles to get willing cooperation. And then we give you tools to be a leader, someone who can influence attitude and behavior. So if you're a manager and a person comes to work late, you know how to have that conversation to get them to come to work on time. So we teach you those principles to get that result. Um, and that's the foundation of how to win friends and influence people. And it's a win-win relationship that we're training so that if I win as a leader, so do you. You get a better relationship. Yeah, it's fantastic. The win-win situation with employee boss is always either sometimes a gray area or sometimes it's on a knife's edge where they just don't communicate with each other and don't figure out. Right. Like I, From my experience, if the employee knows the why of – an order or a command, they're much more apt to follow through with it. Mm -hmm. Whether they agree with it or not, if they know the why, yeah, they're they're much more amenable to doing it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, um, everything you do, and so I'm going to give you kind of a principle um, that we live by, I live by, is that everything you do in a relationship, everything, like the faces that you make, the comments that you make, the sarcasm that we use in relationships, every single thing you do in a relationship either builds it or tears it down. It's black or it's white. And if I were to put um, coffee in this water, it would turn color, right? Mm -hmm. And everything you do after that either builds it up, makes it lighter, clearer, or it makes it darker. And once we realize that in our relationships that matter to us, we can decide knowingly to build it up or tear it down. It's our choice. Yeah. I would just go on and on and on about that, but it's like, yes. Yeah. It's so easy to understand when you break, when you break it down like that. Yeah. Yeah. So we help um, people to think about what they say and how they say it. Um, so that they can be more effective. And when we're more effective, then the relations are um, really easy and really fun. And we can inspire people to a higher level. And then it's win-win for us. And then things start getting done. At yeah. Work. Then everybody's happy. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We There's been so many times in our classes where people come to us either really hungry on how to change the relationships that they have. Or they come, we call them hostages. They come with their arms crossed, like, I don't know why I'm here. My boss should be here, not me. Um, I'm all good. Everything I do is perfect, but it's not me, it's them. And we're able to take that, no matter what the attitude is, and help them discover how to get over, how to get through that barrier to success. So when you ask me, you know, what are some of the common barriers for leaders is one, they need more confidence. Two, they really don't understand that how they communicate is creating that negative environment. Yes, you might have, you know, three workers who've been there for 20 years and they don't want to change, right? But how you communicate can really make a difference. I remember I had an engineer who was like amazing. He was like the smartest person in the room. And he was angry that he'd been passed over for promotion three times. And he was kind of in his 50s. So if he doesn't get promoted now, he's probably not going to be promoted, right? And he was angry, exactly what I described, arms folded, um, bad attitude, just not happy to be in my class. 
And first couple of sessions, um, it was rough because he was really sarcastic, just really nasty comments. But in the fourth session, um, somebody gave him a compliment. And in the class, he said to the woman who is also working on her own communication skills, um, he said to her, you don't have to say that to me. I know that I'm good at what I'm doing. And everybody wanted to take him out in the parking lot and deck him like local style. <laughs> and I said, trust the process. Just trust the process. So at the break, I called him over and I said, hey, can I talk to you? And he said, what? You could scold me. And I said, no, I just wanted to reflect something back to you because I saw the way that you behaved. And did you see her face when you said that? He said, no. I said, okay, do you remember what you said? And he said, no. And I said, okay, so she said this to you. He goes, oh, yeah, I remember that. I said, and you said this to her. On her face, you made her feel really bad for saying a positive comment. In fact, when you, when you said that back to her, what you were saying to her is that she's a liar. He said, I would never do that. I said, I know. I, I didn't think you would do that because you really have a good heart so I know that if you knew you were saying that to somebody, you would never say that to them. He goes, I would never do that. I said, well, I think that's what you did. And he was stunned. And he said, what am I going to do? I said, I don't know. You're smart. You'll figure it out. And he said, well, what am I going to say to her? I said, I don't know. That's, you, you'll figure it out. You're smarter than me. I said, but enjoy your break and, you know, we'll, we'll get back in another 10, 15 minutes. He walked out, and when he came back, you know, he was never the same man again. You know, in that moment, he recognized what he did, and he decided, not me, not his boss, not his company, not anybody in the room, but he decided that he didn't want to be that person anymore. And at the end of the class, he won the highest award of achievement, which means that all of his peers voted him with the highest award. And the award being like the most changed? The person who would emulate being a Dale Carnegie graduate. Oh. Who you would be proud to introduce as a Dale Carnegie graduate. So he won the vote of his peers, which was huge. Huge. Um, and that's kind of what we do at Dale Carnegie. That kind of rolls into the next question that I, I had. Um, and for, if, uh, as far as how to win friends and influencing other people. Mm -hmm. Like that's a big part of it too, right? Yeah. Yeah. How to, how to influence people in a positive way. Now, if you want to manipulate people, there's lots of ways to do that. But that's not what Dale Carnegie is about. Dale Carnegie is about win-win, right? How do, we, how do we bring out the best in each other? How do we bring out the best in our people? Um, and a lot of leaders don't know how to do that. They... They came through a period of time where we didn't want to know about you. We didn't want to know what, what you're, about your family. You know, work is work and home is home. We don't need to know anything about you. Just do your work because I'm paying you every week or every two weeks. Today's very different. If people don't know that you care about them, then you're going to get very limited cooperation. You're going to get limited effort. But if you as a leader can tap into what's important to them, you have the opportunity to help them be their best. Like if I know that this happened with another manager, I'm good. I get along with all my people. My people love me. I'm great. I'm like, okay, where else in your life do you need to be great? I'm perfect. I said, okay. So how about your family life? Oh, yeah, my 13-year-old daughter doesn't talk to me anymore. I'm like, oh, how come? I don't know. She says that I'm just bossy and whatnot. I said, well, if you could improve that relationship, would that be important to you? He goes, I don't think I can. In fact, I'm worried that when she grows up, she'll never talk to me again. I said, well, if she's 13, you better work on it now before yeah. she leaves home. Yeah, you got to fix that. In eight weeks, he was able to change that relationship by applying the Dale Carnegie principles. And so it works at home and in the work life. So do you get a lot of customers coming in uh, wanting to improve on parenting skills too? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They don't, they don't normally come in for that purpose. They just find it through the teachings? They find it and they practice at home as well as in their workplace. And they say, wow, 
Like I have a better relationship with my wife. I have a better relationship with my husband, right? We're not arguing anymore, the kids, right? So it makes a huge difference. Um, I can tell you personally that it helped me be a better parent when I applied the Dale Carnegie principles. And it's mostly from what I'm hearing, just communication. Yes. Fixing your communication. Right, right. Watching that sarcasm, you know, being aware that what you say can make a huge difference. It either builds up a relationship or tears it down. Yeah. I had a, a, a manager in a construction company. He's amazing at work. Like all the customers love him. All the workers love him. But he had a 14-year-old son that he just couldn't do anything with. And he said, I need to fix that relationship because I didn't have a good relationship with my dad. And I'm, I hate it, but I'm doing exactly what my dad did to me. And I said, well, your son's 14. You got a couple years. So we helped him with the way that he communicated. He practiced every week. I don't want to say on, but with his son. And he said, oh, my gosh, in the third week, my son is taking out the trash. And I'm like, okay, is that good? And what it, what do you do when he yeah, does that? Well, you just gotta start sharing. Like, <laughs> how how were the what lessons specifically was he using to get his kid to take out the trash? So those are the Dale Carnegie principles. They're in that golden book. Okay. Yeah. So read the golden book. Read that golden book. It's super simple. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, I find with my kids, um, so long as they know the why and the the conversation is respectful, and I think for them, because I have two boys. The workload is kind of fair and yeah. equal as far as how much they do and whatnot. They're okay doing it. And they see oh, the good. reason why to do it. And so they do it. Good. Sometimes it just takes, you know, reminding over right. and over again. Right. <laughs> like the whole, oh, tell them, then repeat, and then repeat in a harsher tone. And see? Then <laughs> louder right. and harsher. Uh, yeah, that sometimes happens. That yeah. sometimes happens. But I think part of the reason is they're just, they're, Genuinely not paying attention sometimes. So. Yeah, well, they're busy. They're growing up. They have lots of priorities and, you know, the chores doc, are the not. The doctor said their hearing is fine, so yeah. it's not that. Right. So we have, we, <laughs> we have the doctor time to go for a physical. Check their hearing, please. Check their hearing. Oh, yeah, it right. works. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, so it's selective. Yeah. Yeah. Well, those principles help us um, build relationships for life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, learning how to communicate, I think, is key, especially in this digital day and age where communication is so broad and, and is happening so much more. Yeah. Like you can't necessarily be, you know, that introvert that hides out in the side office or in the corner and just does their job and gets through life. I mean, that, that's fine and all, but that's not growing yourself either. Yeah. You know, when um, COVID hit, um, we decided to shift because our – clients really needed us and we couldn't be with them. So we shifted very quickly um, to online learning and we offered free workshops every Friday. It was like appointment television, except it was appointment workshop and people would come every week. And initially they were frightened and they were, they were angry because everything was shut down last March, mm -hmm. April, May, June. And, but what we did is we helped them to see the ability to be flexible, to be agile is going to help them come through the COVID pandemic, right? And how it affected their life, um, both at home and in the office. Um, we believe in giving back to the community. And so we knew that people weren't going to pay for training for a while because they were just trying to survive. Where's that next meal going to yeah, come they didn't from? Yeah, know where the money's going to come from again. Yeah. But the one thing that we could offer, I couldn't offer millions of dollars, but I could offer million dollars of value in helping them overcome the challenges. So we did workshops on managing stress and worry, how to organize when working from home, how to lead your team when you they don't answer your phone call and you got to get on Zoom. So um, we were able to do that. We still offer free workshops um, several times a month, um, and people still come. We built a loyal following, and yeah, some people want everything for free, but you know what? The businesses realize the value in training their people because like what Dale Carnegie discovered many, many years ago is that if you train them, they will improve, right? If you, if you help them be more successful, they are more likely to be successful, so that's kind of been our mantra. And 
I tell you, we are really grateful for this community. We were able to grow our business through COVID, not initially, but eventually. And we were able to show value in what we were offering. Um, and so we do, we still do programs, some of them live, not very many people in the room, um, live online or a hybrid, a combination of both. Very, very cool. Any last uh, things for the audience here? I know time's kind of short. I would say work through your fear. There's always going to be fear in change. There's always going to be things that make you stop and think, should I do it? Can I do it? Am I good enough? Can I really do this successfully? Work through your fear and find people who can support you. So, Because everything that you want lies on the other side of fear. So if we can walk through it with the purpose of getting to the other side, we in Hawaii can accomplish great things. Um, and that's our goal. We want to help people be the best version of themselves. Jan, it's been so awesome having you on. Very inspirational, very valuable. Thank you. Perfect guest for Hawaii Real. Thank you very much. It's our pleasure. All right. And yeah, uh, audience, you can find her. What, do you guys have a website? We do. Um, actually, the best way is to just email me. I'm at jankaeo at dalecarnegie.com. Um, you can go to our Facebook page. You can go to our Instagram page. You can go to LinkedIn and find me. And um, I don't have a secretary that's going to answer all of those. I do it <laughs> myself. My goal, my commitment is to help people become their best. Anything I can do, whether it's paid or unpaid, to help people move their needle, move their cheese, I want to do that. Nice. All right. It's been so great. Thank you. And as always. Thanks, you. Stay happy, Hoy. Get through your shakas, too. <laughs>